near-death experiences. To knowledge, add faith. Two talks given by Dr. Penny Sartori and the Reverend Andrew Fisher at the CFPSS Diamond Jubilee Conference held in Lincoln in September 2013. So I'm going to start a little bit about the history of near-death experiences. So we can go on to this one. So near-death experiences, they're not new. They've been reported throughout history. They've been reported as far back as Plato, which Andrew is going to go into a bit later. Also, there's the work of Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who noted these experiences. And there's also uh, Johann Hamp in Germany. And it was in 1975 when Dr. Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life, was published that these experiences really did capture the imagination of the public in quite a big way. So further to Raymond Moody's work, there was a lot of other research undertaken as well. So in America, these are just a few of the people who have done some work. There was Professor Kenneth Ring, Dr. Michael Sabom, Professor Bruce Grayson, Professor Janice Holden. And then in the UK, the early researchers were Professor Paul Badham, Dr. Peter Fennick, David Lorimer, who's speaking tomorrow, and Dr. Margot Gray. So Dr. Raymond Moody's findings, they were quite retrospective and there was no way that we could ascertain any clinical details. We couldn't check if the patient had come as close to death as what they believed and that we didn't know if they'd been given any drugs at, at the time. And so in the 1970s thank you, and the 1980s, some more work was undertaken. So cardiologist Dr. Michael Sabom began studying his cardiac patients and then Dr. Melvin Morse, who was a paediatrician, also did um, a study in the hospital where he worked. And there's been some recent years, this led on then to prospective hospital studies. And these have been taken by, um, there's five different studies being published. Uh, the first one was Dr. Pinban Lommel and colleagues. There's Dr. Bruce Grayson, Janet Swaninger, Dr. Sam Pania and myself. And at the moment, the AWARE study is being undertaken as well. And that's been undertaken in many hospitals in the UK, in Europe and in America. Now, the advantages of undertaking prospective studies, there are many advantages. We can check the medical details of the patients. We can check what drugs were administered, what their blood gas status was like in some cases, and how close to death these people were. And also with the out-of-body experience as well, that's a component of the near-death experience. We can hide targets around the room to see if people actually identify these targets. And also we can interview members of the medical team as well to check if the details that the patients report are actually accurate. So the first of the studies published was by Dr. Pim van Lommel in the Netherlands. And out of 344 patients who'd had a cardiac arrest and survived, 18% of them reported a near-death experience. There was one very good case where one of the patients described an out-of-body experience where he correctly identified watching the nurse remove his dentures and put them into the crash cart. And um, this, this study was actually published in The Lancet, which is one of the most prestigious medical journals. So it was quite a breakthrough, really, for that to be published there. The next study was by Dr. Sam Parnia and colleagues done at Southampton University. This went on for a year. And out of 63 patients who survived a cardiac arrest, 11% reported a near-death experience. Then in America, Janet Swaninger and colleagues, out of 174 cardiac arrest survivors uh, cases, 55 patients survived and 30 of these patients were interviewable. And she found that 23% reported a near-death experience. Then again in America, Dr. Bruce Grayson interviewed 116 survivors of cardiac arrest and found nearly 16% reported a near-death experience. And then with my study, I had three different samples in my study. So 
sample two was just the cardiac arrest survivors. So there were 39 cardiac arrest survivors, and out of those, nearly 18% reported a near-death experience. There were some very interesting cases that I came across. Patient 11, for example, he had this out-of-body experience where he described sitting on the shoulder of the nurse, watching her perform some nursing care. And then he said he felt that he was sucked upwards in a vortex of warm air, and he went into another worldly realm, and he met one of his deceased relatives. And he said it was a lovely experience, all his pain had disappeared, he felt this deep, unconditional love. And he said he just wanted to stay there. But this relative who he met said, no, you're the head of the family, you've got to go back to look after the others. And um, before he went back, this relative gave him some information. She said, I want you to give this message to one of his living relatives. So when he revived, he gave this message to his living relative. And she was absolutely astounded that he should know this information because it was something that she'd gone to great lengths to keep a secret from him. So to me, that was quite remarkable because during a time when he was deeply unconscious and his brain was severely physiologically insulted, he actually gained information in ways other than through the senses. So there's no way that we can explain that. And it's very difficult to explain it away as well. Also then, the second interesting case was patient 10. And this patient again had an out-of-body experience. He very accurately described what the nurse did, what the doctor did, and what the physiotherapist did. At the time, he was deeply unconscious. His Glasgow sco coma score was the lowest it could be, which is 3 out of 15. Yet, he reported being up above the ceiling, it's as if the ceiling had disappeared. And he said, I could see the doctor touching my eye, and I could see the nurse cleaning my mouth, and I could see the physiotherapist looking very nervous and frightened. And he said he, she was poking her head around the curtains to look at me to check on my condition. Now, I know this was correct because I was the nurse. I was there at the time. And so that's really quite a unique case because I know how deeply unconscious he was, yet what he reported was very accurate. And further to this, he went into another, what he described as a pink room, where he met his dead father, his dead mother-in-law, who he'd never met, but he recognised from photographs, and an also a man who he described could have been Jesus. But he said, I'm not sure if it was Jesus, because this man had long hair, and it was long and scruffy, and it needed a good combing. So it's, <laughs> 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 so it's not what he expected Jesus to look like. <laughs> <laughs> but he said he had to go back. His, uh, the Jesus figure said, no, it's not your time, you have to go back. And so he went back, and as soon as he was back in his body, he was in immediate pain. But the interesting thing about this case is that the man has cerebral palsy. So for 60 years of his age, his hand, his right hand, is in a permanently uh, contracted position like this. Now, when I interviewed this patient, I, he misunderstood one of my questions. And what I was saying to him was, when you were out of your body, was there anything that you, can't, that you can do that you can't normally do? Now, by that, I was trying to um, get that some people, when they have an out-of-body experience, they think of a location, say the pyramids of Egypt, and they find themselves there instantly. So that's what I was getting at. But he misinterpreted that, and he said, oh yeah, look, I can open my hand out. Now, his hand had gone from that to that. At first, I didn't understand the significance of this. It was only when I went and asked the doctor and the physiotherapist about this that I realised this shouldn't be physiologically possible. They said in order for his hand to move out fully, he'd have to have an operation to release the tendons because his tendons would be in a permanently contracted position. But that wasn't done, and I checked his notes. He had no hand physiotherapy, nothing like that. So there's no explanation for how this can happen. And if you look at the screen here, that's a photo of the kind, what his hand was like and what it is like now. And you can see he's opening out, out that fully. And his sister has actually signed a statement to say, yes, this is correct. He can only open out his hand fully since he had that experience. So that is something that we really can't understand. So now that we're able to do these hospital studies, we're uncovering cases like this, which are very hard to kind of dismiss and explain away. 
So, okay. So the conclusions of all the prospective research that's been done so far, and it is ongoing, is that the near-death experiences, they certainly do occur. They have very real and life-changing effects. And there are some aspects that can't be explained by the premise that consciousness is just a byproduct of the brain. And so I think our current understanding of consciousness really does need to be revised and expanded upon, really. And um, yes, there are some recent cases. You may be very much aware of these because they've been in the media quite a lot. The first one is a lady called Anita Morjani. And she's from Hong Kong, and she was at the end stages of lymphoma. She was expected to die. She'd uh, deteriorated at home. She'd had many uh, months of treatment of chemotherapy. And she was transferred to hospital and ended up being admitted to the intensive care unit. And she rapidly deteriorated and lost consciousness. And when she was in a coma, she had a very deep near-death experience, which really did profoundly affect her. And it also, she gained insight into the way that she'd been living her life as well. Her family had been warned that this was the end, and her brother had actually flown into Hong Kong to be at her side. But remarkably, Anita started to recover. And she found that she did recover very quickly, and her lymphoma it's it's gone it's actually gone now she did have some big tumors which at the time shrunk down very rapidly as well so she completely changed her point of view she completely changed her way of life and now she actually goes about speaking quite publicly about her experience but unfortunately there are a lot of skeptical people out there as well and you know there's a lot of people who kind of um, think that she's trying to make money by doing these talks which i i think is incredible really there's also the case of Dr. Eben Alexander. Now, he's a brain surgeon, and he contracted meningitis, and he was admitted to intensive care, and he was in a drug-induced coma for seven days. On recovery, he described a very deep and intricate near-death experience. A particularly interesting aspect of his experience was he, he had like a butterfly on his shoulder, and it had a face of a lady on there. Now, he didn't recognise this face at all, but um, Eben Alexander is actually adopted, and he made some contact with his birth family, and following his recovery from intensive care, the family had visited him, and they sent him a photograph of his sister from his birth family, who he'd never met, but she died before he'd met her. Her name was Betsy, and when he looked at the photograph, he recognised the photograph of Betsy as the face of the butterfly that was on his shoulder during his near-death experience. So that's quite a remarkable aspect, I think. Um, he tried to explain his near-death experience from a neurophysiological perspective, being a, a neurosurgeon, but he was unable to explain it. What he'd been taught in medical school didn't fit in with what he'd actually experienced. So as a result, he's had to reconsider his beliefs on consciousness and what they are. So he speaks very publicly about his experience, which I think is very unusual because when I worked as a nurse, I know I worked with many doctors who were quite sceptical, but then some of them came up to me and sometimes many years later, one doctor I worked with, I worked with him for 12 years, and then he came up to me after I'd done my research and he said, I actually had one of these experiences. So it's very rare that doctors will share this information because it's very much against what they've been taught, really. So I think this is quite a brief... There has been a, quite a, a critical article written about Dr. Al Alexander, but that focuses on his life prior to his experience. Um, the next case is this lady called Raja Benamore. She's from Morocco, and I was lucky enough to meet her when I spoke at a conference in Marseille in March of this year. And in 2009, she had this very unique near-death experience. She had many after-effects. When I met her, she was wearing dark glasses because the lights, they were just lights like this, they were really affecting her eyes. So she had to have these dark glasses on. She also developed really bad electromagnetic changes in her, in her body as well. And um, any electrical items that she was around, she used to get shock, um, really bad electric shocks from as well. 
but during her experience she went into hospital for a minor operation and as she had the injection of anaesthetic so she had this really deep near-death experience she had a life review where she reviewed the whole of her life back to the beginning of her birth but it went further than that she went back to the birth of the whole universe and she described that she had infinitesimal memory of everything and everything that happened to her body at a cellular level and a molecular level and she felt the impact that it had on the body she felt the electromagnetic fields and she felt liquefaction and the moment of death and this occurred until she actually woke up from her experience but the interesting thing about Raja is that she, in, she acquired this very deep intellectual abilities and this deep understanding of quantum physics. Now, she'd never studied quantum physics before, but as a result of her experience, she's now been motivated to study it at university level, which she does. And the interesting thing in this um, conference is they'd videoed her university physics professor, and he described that he didn't know how Raja could have acquired this knowledge that she has of quantum physics. It's not something you can acquire from reading a few books on quantum physics. It's something that is really built up over years and years of acquired knowledge. And he said further to this, some of the things that Raja has been writing about in her papers, not even her physics professor understands. But he says, since she's written about them, there have been articles published in physics journals which is supporting what she's saying. So this lady is quite remarkable. She's got all this knowledge during a time, it was acquired during a time when she was very much unconscious. So these experiences are really quite a lot more than what we realise, I think. Um, right, so I think it's certain that near-death experiences do occur and they have these very real life-changing effects on people. Um, and they can't be explained anymore from a materialist point of view. So this suggests to me that we've got to consider consciousness from a different perspective. But I think that is another paper in itself, so I'm not going to go into that aspect. Mm -hmm. So how can we benefit from having a greater understanding of these experiences? Well, I think this is highlighting that um, we need to change our understanding of consciousness. Um, like our current worldview, our current worldview says consciousness is created by the brain. We're just having this conscious experience because processes are going on in the brain now. Um, our current worldview is that we're all separate. We're all individual people and we're completely separate. And then life is about survival of the fittest. And okay. So how our beliefs have actually developed, if you think about it, first of all, religion was first the, the dominant for uh, belief system and then this was superseded by the scientific revolution and then we had people like Isaac Newton and Darwin which were very influential into how we developed and if you look at our scientific process it's really quite amazing um, without our science we wouldn't have the technology that we have and we wouldn't have the advances in healthcare that we have as well and science, I think, is a very rigorous process. It develops through replication of experiments and measuring things. But there is one aspect that we can't measure, and no one in this room would deny it's not true, and that's love. And so I think that our science has evolved with a great disconnection of the mind from the body. Okay. So our science does change, and if you think about it, we once th thought that the, the Earth was flat until it was discovered otherwise through our scientific development. And then we thought that the, uh, the Earth was the centre of the universe until that was uh, deemed otherwise. Okay. So is consciousness a, a consciousness is a byproduct of the brain? Is it a scientific fact? Or are we getting new un understanding of consciousness? And we're all separate. Is that too a scientific fact? So, um, okay, so the message of the near-death experience, that's what I want to focus on, because 
when we try and pathologise these experiences, and is it due to neurological processes or psychological processes, I think we're missing out on the biggest point, and that is the message. These people have such an important message to share with us all. And some of the messages are that we're all interconnected. We're all a part of one great whole. And, for example, patients in my study, um, I think... Patient 6 said, I think harmony is a good way to describe it. And patient 11, I felt a sense of harmony and united with the world. Everything comes together in one. Everything is right, you know. And then Dr. Yvonne Casson has had an experience, and she says, there is but one source. We are all directly connected to that source. The bottom line is that what it's all about is love. Loving ourselves, loving each other, and loving the divine. And then many people have a life review during their experience. And that really is quite a, a fascinating aspect because people relive their lives and they can sometimes experience it, often from a third-person perspective. So if they've been particularly unkind to someone, they can feel what it's like to be on the receiving end of that. And conversely, if they've been particularly nice to someone, they can also feel what it's like to receive that, uh, that love. And this is an example from the International Association of Near-Death Studies. My life review proceeded to show me every single event of my 22 years of life in a kind of instant 3D panoramic review. The brightness showed me every second of all those years in exquisite detail in what seemed only an instant of time. Watching and re-experiencing all those events in my life changed everything. It was an opportunity to see and feel all the love that I had shared, and more importantly, all the pain that I had caused. I was able to simultaneously re-experience not only my own feelings and thoughts, but those of all of the other people I had ever interacted with. Seeing myself through their eyes was a very humbling experience. And there's also something called empathic death experiences and this is where people at the bedside of their dying loved ones can also share in a partial journey into the light and also people if they're separated by distance can manifest symptoms of a dying person many miles away so in 1935 einstein rose and Ampodolsky published the results of experiments that they'd undertaken with electrons. Electrons that had been in close connection with each other, they sent them off on infinite distances apart, and what they found was when they stopped the spin on one of the electron, the spin on the other electron stopped at precisely the same time. And they couldn't understand that because there should have been some time lag with it. And so Einstein called this spooky action at a distance. <laughs> and it's now called quantum entanglement. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that goes a long way really to kind of explaining as well these empathic death experiences um, next one oh yes another one of the messages it's the golden rule which is the heart of all religions treat others as you would wish to be treated yourself and this is another example one big thing I learned when I died was that we're all part of one big living universe if we think we can hurt another person or another living thing without hurting ourselves, we are sadly mistaken. Another, uh, another message is that love and compassion. These people share, want to share their love and spread compassion to other people. Now, has anyone seen the DVD called I Am? It's quite a lovely DVD. It's really uh, great. I would recommend it. Darcia Keltner is a professor of psychology at Berkeley. And he mentions that in Darwin's book, The Descent of Man, the word love appears 95 times. And survival of the fittest is only mentioned twice. <laughs> so Darwin noted that we have evolved as a species, not because we've got great strength and large fangs and great speed and agility. We've evolved because we have the ability to cooperate and we have sympathy. So Darwin noted that sympathy was the strongest instinct in nature. So there are very deep reasons as to why we've evolved to be good to each other. It's wired into our DNA. But unfortunately, Thomas Huxley and other proponents of Darwin's theory had the far more sinister view and looked at the survival of the fittest ethos. So we've been conditioned into that belief, really. 
And Dean Radin makes a really good point, and he says, if we all take Darwin's survival of the fittest, then we're all very selfish and we act in a, only in consideration of our own interest. But if we see each other as interconnected, then we behave in very different ways. So these ways are far more conducive to our evolution, as well as survival of the planet and survival of the human race. And the following point illustrates this. I know it's an old cliché, love makes the world go round, but don't you see that's true? I learned that in my near-death experience. The problem is that most of us just don't know how to love, do we? We're full of pride, jealousy, lust, and an almost insatiable craving for money and power. TV is full of this garbage. Why this is, I don't know, but we're going to pay for this self-centred and unloving behaviour, whether in this life or the next one. I think we pay for it now, though right here on earth, because you do, if you don't know how to love, you can't experience the joy of living. That is what my near-death experience taught me. So the implications of this. Oh yes, another um, message of the near-death experience is live in the moment as well. Don't worry about things, just be in the moment. So the implications of this. Professor Kenneth Ring did some fascinating work in the 1980s and he actually taught near-death experiences at the University of Connecticut for many years. And he surveyed some of, his uh, some of his students and what he found was that people who engaged with the near-death experience were very much changed in the, the way that people who'd had a near-death experience were. And he likened it to a benign virus. And this is what Professor Ring says. It appears as if some of the benefits of the near-death experience can be transmitted vicariously simply by presenting relevant information on the subject to individuals who are or become interested in near-death experiences. There's increased altruism to others as well following the near-death experience and this has many health benefits for, from us. When we have in all these ex um, feelings of altruism and love for others, we're actually increasing our positive emotions. Our immunoglobulin A, which is the first line of defence against pathogens in our saliva, and our oxytocin levels, all of these are raised in our body. And all of these are really good and conducive to good health. So, and also as well, people, when they've had a near-death experience, have greater awareness of the planet as a whole. And uh, they become more eco-aware and adopt more eco-friendly behaviour as well. And then all of this is really conducive to our advancement in, of our evolution. So I'm just going to finish off now with um, one lady called Christine Stewart who wrote to me many years ago after her experience. She said, I was like, a, I was like most kids of 11, mucking about on my way home from school that day. I stepped off the pavement without looking into the path of an oncoming car, which hit me in the back. I was thrown across the road, and I remember thinking it was going to hurt when I landed. I heard a loud snap, and I saw a flash, at which moment I was rising out of my body at rapid speed. I felt no pain as I seemed to lift higher and higher. It became dark, and it, I was still travelling rapidly. There was an overwhelming sense of being loved, like the whole universe loved me. I came to a stop in, some, in front of some sort of barrier which looked like a privet hedge. There were flowers growing in the hedge which were huge, much bigger than my head. Beyond the, head, the hedge there were people looking out at me and they all seemed very interested. Then there was the lady, I call her the shining one. She was so beautiful. I knew immediately that she was hundreds of years old but had the face of someone perhaps in their thirties. I was happy to be there, and the feeling of love and peace was beautiful. You must return, the lady said, although I never once saw her mouth move. I went to object, at which moment I found myself in a great deal of pain back on the side of the road with ambulance men and a crowd of people around me. I learned that my experience was something I should keep quiet about because people looked at me strangely if I spoke about it. I won't ever forget it, and as I grew older, I realised that many more folk other than myself had had a similar experience. The experience has helped me through some of the darkest times in my life. Death is not the end. And then I'll just finish with a quote, which is, my belief is that if everyone had a near-death experience, 
There would never be another war, no one would starve or be the victim of violence, and greed would become a thing of the past. So let's not ignore these experiences anymore. Let's hear what these people have to say and share in their wisdom and insight. I would like to thank all of the patients in my study and all of the people who have written to me and emailed me over the years because they have been my greatest teachers. So we can all uh, engage with the message of the near-death experience and hear what these people have to say and we can all benefit with it, from it without having to nearly die. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> Well, as Penny shared with us, we know that near-death experiences happen. And we know that many people who have had a near-death experience are convinced, they know, that they have experienced something of life after death. In this part of our talk, I would like to reflect on an encounter with a hospital patient I met once who had had a near-death experience. And I'd also like to offer some observations about what faith has to add to this knowledge, especially the Christian faith, as we are the Church's Fellowship for Psychical and Spiritual Studies. Well, for just under five years, I've worked as a Church of England chaplain in an acute NHS hospital. And I was once asked to visit a patient following his surgery. To protect the patient's anonymity, I'll call him John. And I found John sat in a wheelchair next to his bed. And John said to me, I'm glad you've come. I need to speak to somebody about something that has happened to me. I don't really know who to speak to, but you chaplains know about spiritual stuff, don't you? So as you can imagine, there was no pressure on my part. <laughs> so I sat down with John and I let him talk. John, he told me, had been admitted into hospital for a routine operation. And following his surgery, he'd been told by his doctors that he died during the procedure. His heart had stopped and the surgeons had to resuscitate him. But incredibly, incredibly, John already knew that he died because he'd experienced it. John told me about his experience. He was middle-aged, rational, and intelligent. And incidentally, I ought to say that John had been born a paraplegic, and he'd never been able to walk, hence his being in a wheelchair. Now, whilst John was being operated on, under general anaesthetic, he somehow felt that he'd been separated from his physical body and found himself travelling down a dark tunnel at an incredible speed. And at the end of the tunnel, there was a bright light, but not a kind of light, not a kind of brightness that hurt his eyes. And John found that he was standing on a beach with no sign of his wheelchair and no sign of his paraplegia. And for the first time in John's life, he could feel the weight of his body on his legs, he could feel the sand oozing between his toes, and he could feel the waters lapping around his ankles. Across the water, John could see an island where his mother and father were standing, and his aunties and uncles, all of whom had died many years before. And they looked pleased to see John. They were all smiling and waving at him. And as John began to realise the gravity of his situation, he heard a voice say, No, your time has not yet come. And the scene began to fade as John felt himself travelling back down that tunnel that had brought him to that place. Of course, John had had a near-death experience, and his experience had made a profound impression on him. John told me that because of his experience, he now had absolutely no fear of dying, and he knew now that there was more to life than his present fare. John has not been the only patient to have shared such an experience with me. 
and experiences similar to John's are recorded throughout history. The earliest written account is in Plato's Republic. Some of you may know the story. Thousands of years ago, Plato recorded that a soldier named Ur had been killed on the battlefield. And some days later, Ur's body revived whilst he was on a funeral pyre. And Ur described to the folk around him a journey to the hereafter. Ur explained how, freed from his body, he'd found himself at a series of openings where divine beings sent virtuous souls up to heaven and undeserving souls down to to the place. And one of the divine beings told Ur that he must become a messenger for them and return to tell the living on earth about the hereafter, which of course is what Ur did. In the Bible, in St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, composed, scholars say, sometime after 54 Common Era, St. Paul describes himself being caught up into paradise and hearing things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. And the Roman Catholic scholar Carol Zaleski has catalogued similar experiences from medieval times onwards. As Penny mentioned, it wasn't until 1975 when Dr. Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life, was published that the near-death experience was named and defined as a concept. And Moody, a Methodist and a psychiatrist, interviewed 150 people, all of whom had reported similar experiences. And Moody realised that certain attributes occurred again and again, and in the experiences that he studied, many of those attributes were present in John's near-death experience, as John explained it to me. I think if we're to consider what faith has to say about near-death experiences, it's important for us to understand what these attributes are, as identified by Moody. Well, firstly, the patients described their experiences to Moody as being inexpressible or ineffable. One patient said to Moody, there is a real problem for me as I'm trying to tell you this. Our world, the one we're living in now, is three-dimensional, but the next one definitely isn't. That's why it's so hard to tell you this. That's as close as I can get to it but it's not really adequate. We might remember that John didn't know who to speak to about his experience, finally plumping for the hapless chaplain because John thought he would know about spiritual stuff. Next, the people Moody interviewed often reported that they could hear their doctors pronouncing them dead. One doctor said to Moody, We tried for some time to resuscitate the patient, but we weren't having any success. I thought she'd gone. I told the other doctor who was working with me, let's try one more time and then we'll give up. This time we got her heart beating and she came round. Later I asked her what she remembered of her death. She said she couldn't remember much about it, except she did hear me say, Let's try one more time, and then we'll give up. Patients also reported feeling the sensation of being pulled rapidly through a dark space or a tunnel. And that tunnel was an important feature of John's near-death experience. Some patients described themselves looking upon their own physical body from a point outside of it. One woman reported... I heard the nurses shout, code pink, code pink. And as they were saying this, I could feel myself moving out of my body. On my way up, I saw more nurses come into the room. There must have been a dozen of them. I drifted on up past the light fixture. I saw it from the side and very distinctly. Then I stopped, floating right below the ceiling, looking down. Many patients said to Moody that they found themselves in another body upon the release of their physical one. 
Moody in his book called that body the spiritual body. Other Christians might call that body the soul or the subtle body. And that spiritual body is weightless. It's invisible, non-corporeal and inaudible. Moody documents many patients who are aware of other spiritual beings in their vicinity. Beings who were apparently there to ease them through their transition into death or to tell them that their time had not yet come. One person said to Moody, I realised that all these people were there, almost in multitudes it seems, hovering around the ceiling of the room. They were all people I'd known in my past life, but who had passed on before. It was almost as if I was coming home. They were there to greet me or welcome me. John told me how, during his near-death experience, he could see his departed father and mother and aunties and uncles smiling at him and waving at him. Moody also interviewed some patients whose near-death experiences went deeper than John's. And many patients talked about having an encounter with a being of light. And that being of light is brilliant. But the brilliance doesn't dazzle or hurt the person or keep them from seeing anything else around them. The love and the warmth emanating from that being of light is beyond words. People feel completely surrounded by it, taken up into it, and completely at ease with it. The language used by the patients can be very mystical. Some describe the being of light as being Christ or an angel. All the people that Moody interviewed reckoned the being, however they described it, to be an emissary or a guide. The appearance of that being of light marks the moment when the patient is presented with a review of their life. And that review can be instantaneous, with everything appearing at once, all of it very vivid and very real. Past emotions are relived. But interestingly, throughout that review, the being of light offers no judgment, but rather provokes reflection on the person's part. And the being of light stresses the importance of two things in life. Our learning to love, and the acquiring of knowledge. One patient said this about the being of light and her life review. All through this, he kept stressing the importance of love. He showed me some instances where I had been selfish to my sister, but then just as many times where I had really shown love to her and had shared with her. He pointed out that I should try to do things for other people, to try my best. There wasn't any accusations in this. When he came across times I had been selfish, his attitude was only that I had been learning from them. He seemed very interested in things concerning knowledge. He kept on pointing out things that had to do with learning. And he did say that I was going to continue learning. And he said that even when he comes back for me, because by this time he had told me that I was going back, that there will always be a quest for knowledge. He said that it is a continuous process. So I got the feeling that it goes on after death. I think he was trying to teach me as he went through those flashbacks with me. Of course, all the people that Moody interviewed came back at some point during their experience. Like John, some remembered being drawn back towards their physical bodies, often feeling a tug or a pull. And many reported that towards the end of their near-death experience, they fell asleep or lapsed into unconsciousness, later to awaken back in their physical bodies. Importantly for any of us who give spiritual and pastoral care, Moody notes that the intense emotions associated with a near-death experience can linger on for some time after the event. One patient said to Moody, After I came back, I cried off and on for weeks. 
because I had to live in this world after seeing that one. I didn't want to come back. Moody concluded, it must be emphasised that a person who has been through an experience of this type has no doubt whatsoever as to its reality and its importance. Well, apart from the odd few shining lights like Penny, traditionally healthcare professionals have been sceptical of near-death experiences as the experiences cannot be validated by science. But those psychological and physiological factors may interact in conjunction with near-death experiences. As yet, there is not one physiological or psychological theory that fits all cases and all circumstances. So if medical science cannot explain the near-death experience, can Christian faith and theology shed more light on the phenomena? Well, many Christian theologians see near-death experiences in a positive light. The German Lutheran minister Johann Christoph Hamp published his book in 1979 entitled To Die is Gain. And interestingly, Hamp's research was completely independent of Moody's. And Hamp wrote To Die is Gain after having a near-death experience of his own. To back up his experience, Hamp scoured the paranormal journals of his time for accounts similar to his own experience. And he declared himself surprised and bewildered by the testimonies he found. His near-death experience gave Hamp the evidence that he needed that the body is left behind at death and the soul goes on. Hamp writes, Dying can be equated with entry into the kingdom in which we can suffer no pain because the organ through which the soul can experience pain has remained behind. The self leaves the body and sees the body lying beneath it like an empty shell or a discarded dress. Hamp goes on to suggest that near-death experiences could have beneficial results in medicine, the counselling professions and the churches if only the disciplines would talk to one another. He writes, If dying is not oppression, my knowledge that I am going to die will no longer oppress me. Instead of making me feel melancholy, it will expand and deepen me. My loneliness is broken because these experiences strengthen my belief in the continuance of an indestructible core in me and in my fellow man. Hamp believed that doctrines which describe death as sleep or extinction contradicted his own experience and research, and it paralysed his faith. To Hamp, the New Testament taught continued existence with God after death, and this was reinforced by his findings. In 1982, the British theologians Paul and Linda Badham published their book, Immortality or Extinction. And the Badham's research brought them to an important conclusion in which they agreed with Hamp and the experiences of John and so many other patients. They wrote, The reports made by resuscitated persons about their supposed observations provide some of the strongest grounds for supposing that the separation of the self from the body is possible. What appears to happen is that the soul leaves the body and begins to move on to another mode of existence. And the Badams saw the increase in reported near-death experiences as a revitalising of belief in God and the hope of life after death. Like Hamp, Paul Badham notes that the experiential foundation for belief in a future life may derive both from religious experience of a relationship with God 
and from the reports of people who, near the frontiers of death, believe that they have caught a glimpse of a life beyond. In 1994, the Protestant minister, Judith Cressy, published her book entitled The Near-Death Experience, Mysticism or Madness. And in it, Cressy parallels the accounts of mystics and those who have had a near-death experience. And Cressy observed that the feelings of unconditional love and self-worth reported by mystics and by those who have had a near-death experience, were the one and the same. And Cress's advice on the subject, both as a theologian and a pastor, is invaluable. Cressy reminds us that whatever state people who have had a near-death experience might return in, they will require help to integrate their experience into ongoing, everyday life. And Cressy bids us to be careful not to put those who have had a near-death experience on any kind of pedestal. For whilst these people may have glimpsed things not revealed to everyone, they are still not yet perfected saints. All of this takes me back to my encounter with John. And in the hospital, I was able to see John twice more before he was discharged we talked about his near-death experience and we talked about near-death experiences in general. We also talked about the nature of the soul and about the unconditional love of God. And together we began to think about how John might go on in life after having such a profound experience. We both knew that for John, life and death would never be the same again. The psychiatrist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross believed that death is the final stage of growth. However, the near-death experience as recorded from the times of Ur and St. Paul and throughout the ages suggests that we go on after death and our growth continues. A reading often requested at funerals is part of a sermon preached by Henry Scott Holland, sometime canon at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. The reading begins by saying, Death is nothing at all. I have only slipped away into the next room. Canon Scott Holland was very aware of the finality of death, of life as we experience it. Yet he was equally confident of our lives continuing after death. Christian doctrines of life after death, if they're to mean anything, depend on God's personal blessings of love and the relationships that that love nurtures. Churches and chaplains and the Church's Fellowship for Psychical and Spiritual Studies can, I think, best support people who have had near-death experiences by helping folk to channel what they've learned from their experience and to put it into practical use. The best way for anyone to process a near-death experience is to use what they've learned from it in order to help someone else. For me, as a hospital chaplain, My work was finished when John found a way to bring into everyday life the love that he'd received in his near-death experience. But that, as they say, is another story. Thank you. Penny, all your stories have been positive near-death experiences there are there what percentage of people uh, come back from a terrifying near-death experience okay um, well it depends on whose research you look at 
Um, but roughly about 14% of all near-death experiences can be of the frightening kind. Right. Um, in my research, I came across two people who had the frightening kind. The first one was the usual prototypical near-death experience, but it was interpreted in a very unpleasant way. But the second one I came across, the lady actually believed that she'd been looking into hell and she was terrified. She was so... Mm -hmm. What she'd gone through, when I started to interview her, the memory came back immediately and she was really terrified. You could see the look in her face. Mm -hmm. She started to cry and almost to the point of hysteria. Mm -hmm. So I had to terminate the interview because mm -hmm. she was so upset. And when I went back to see her about two days later, she didn't want to talk about it again just mm -hmm. because the just evoking the memory of it it's, it's a little bit like post-traumatic stress disorder yeah, really yeah. it was very frightening for her and there's not enough in the literature really about these frightening experiences no. either so um, no, i think it's important to acknowledge them so thank you for bringing yeah. that up i know in, in american fundamentalism there's a book doing the rounds where uh, some guy claims to have had this trip to so-called hell mm -hmm. and of course it backs up the fundamentalist belief system and uh, it's doing great business, you know, for them. Mm -hmm. um, and he's going around giving lectures on it. Sounds awful, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But I, I just wondered then, from our Christian perspective, you know, we, we, we can focus on the kind of oneness, unity, overwhelming love experience, which mm -hmm. is fantastic. But I, I'm just wondering if there are any theories on these negative experiences. There's a few. Um, some people believe it's because it's influenced by the fundamentalist religious beliefs. Cultural programming yes, or something. Right. Yeah, so that's one of the theory. Mm. Um, and there's no evidence to say that people who behave in a, a moralistic way um, are not yeah. going to have this experience mm. either. So we don't really know why it is. But um, there's a case, recent case actually, of um, an anaesthetist from uh, California, Dr. Rajiv Party. He's just written his book about his experience. Mm. But it started off where he did believe he was in hell and it was he mm. could feel the pain, he could feel the heat and it was an awful experience. But he suddenly got an insight into the way that he'd been living his life. And he said that all of a sudden being confronted with those hellish images made him confront what he'd been like. And he realized the way he'd been living his life wasn't it was for his own benefit and not yeah. for the consideration of others. Mm. And as soon as he changed his thoughts and had that insight, it changed into a very pleasant experience mm. where his deceased father and grandfather came and took him into the light. Right. So Two and one. Right. OK. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> About half a century ago, I was at the College of Psychic Science, just on a social evening, mm -hmm. and uh, there's just one other youngish man there, and I asked him what brought him here. And uh, he told me that he was Irish, he, his mother had brought him up as an ardent Protestant, yes. and her best wish for him was for him to enter the, uh, the ministry. And he'd just gone along with it. Mm -hmm. And whilst he was at training college, he went out uh, to little churches in the, st in the sticks. Mm -hmm. And after one service there, an old lady came up and said, how wonderful it was to see a young man speaking so sincerely. And he felt such a heel mm -hmm. that he gave it all up, yeah. left down and went to London uh, and got a job, I think, with the shipping agency. And he was in a bed sit. Uh, and he was sitting there one evening, and the light was going dark. Uh, it was just a simple room, and he got out of his chair to turn the light on, which was just one of those, you know, egg things hanging from the ceiling over the bed. Uh -huh. And he got up, and he couldn't hold it. And his hand was going through it. And he turned round and saw himself asleep in the chair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why he, he knew he needed help. And that's what took him to the College of Psychic Science to experiment it. Yes, that's really fascinating. It's just an out of mm -hmm. the yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. And I think quite a few people get those spontaneous cases where they just kind of leave their body and don't realise what's happening at first. And it can happen in circumstances other than being close to death as well, so yes. And on the campsite, mm -hmm. when I was by myself late at night in Switzerland, a magnificent starry night. 
Mm -hmm. I just found myself in my tiny tent and just sitting next to me for a couple there having that evening brew and they invited mm -hmm. me over and we got talking. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that he was uh, been a sergeant in the RAF. Mm -hmm. And we were saying, you know, how anybody can believe all this happened by accident, you know, and he got yeah. talking like mm -hmm. that. He said, oh, I said, hey, I'm, uh, uh, when I was in hospital, I was in hospital a long time, having been shot down. Uh, and he said, I was lying in bed one night, and I felt as though there was a motor here, and I could rev it up. Mm -hmm. So I was just, I was just playing with myself, zooming it up. So I wonder how far it can go. <laughs> And he read it right off, a bit of a pop, and he found himself standing at the end of the bed. Wow. Wow, very interesting. Yeah, and mm -hmm. he went up and down the board and thought, oh, I better get back into myself again. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But wow. that's what he convinced him. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes, it would be good to do an experiment with someone like him who could do yeah. it at will, because yeah. we could hide things around the place then. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 so yeah, I just thought the two instances. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Have there ever been any instances of somebody who's left their body who was uh, supposed to be dead and um, something's been hidden or they've, they've um, said that they, can, they have seen something that they wouldn't have been able to see from lying on the bed? Um, yes, there's a, there are a few cases, but they've never actually been verified in hospital studies that are going on now. Although in the study that I did, I hid hidden uh, symbols around the room. No one saw those. But there are anecdotally reported cases. There is one of um, a patient who left her body and described floating outside the hospital and seeing the tennis shoe on the ledge outside, reported it to Kimberly Clark Sharp, who was the social worker looking after her. She looked outside the window and couldn't see anything. So she went to the other side of the hospital, looked out from a different perspective, and she could see the tennis shoe there. So there's that case. Mm -hmm. Just thinking of um, events with um, people's conscious mind, people suffering from possible mental conditions, and people have heard um, vo voices or um, have uh, possible sight defects and, and so on. Um, I, I seem, seem to remember a parapsychology weekend at Exeter and I think a smaller number of examples were given but um, where people had had out of body experiences um, they weren't um, verified by, by um, actual objects in the um, uh, hospital room and so on so mm -hmm. that they what they saw was possibly imaginary. Um, mm -hmm. One thinks of uh, Transfiguration incidences in the in the in the Bible, perhaps, and um, the nineteenth-century visual viewer, which you're looking out into space, the two viewers, and uh, it's an optical illusion, but you're actually look you seem to be looking out into space, uh, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and um, obviously it's uh, it's an optical illusion, it's an optical toy, but. Um, what you see is, is not not real. You're looking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you seem to be looking out into space, but you're not. And um, another instance, perhaps, of somebody coming around in in in, in hospital, and um, um, the sequence of numbers does not fit. It, um, it's not complete. Perhaps somebody mm -hmm. dying in the next bed. Perhaps I don't know. Mm -hmm. But you're actually just coming back into consciousness, mm -hmm. and until you actually hit the surface as well of, of consciousness and come back. To to, to your normal self, you're, you're in limbo, as it were. So. Yes, that's a really good point about coming back into consciousness, because when I did my study, I had a few cases where I thought, oh, this sounds like this patient's had a near-death experience. And when I followed up and investigated it in depth, I actually found out it was things that were actually going on in the background. They were picking up on staff conversation as they were regaining their consciousness. So you're quite right there. That's a really important point, yes. Thank you. And, and can, can I just build on that a little? Uh, from my experience uh, dealing with folk who are near death in hospital, um, a sort of similar thing to a near death is experience is, is nearing death awareness. Um, uh, and I've lost count of the amount of families that I've been with uh, and folk who are dying who have seen departed relatives in the room with them and have conversed with them. Um, 
yeah, the, 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 a similar thing happens there. Yeah. I've kept a dream diary for about two thirds of my life, and um, on one or two occasions, not very many, I've had dreams which are very like near death experiences. What I was wondering is, is there somebody who's done some work on the correlation between the kind of dream experiences and near death experiences? I'm not aware of any dream, do you? Uh, not dreams specifically. Uh, Robert Crookall did a really good book um, called um, Mystical. Oh, what's the title of the book? Um, Interpretation of Cosmic and Mystical Experiences. Thank you. Uh, and Crookall uh, parallels the experiences of mystics that have been recorded um, with, with the experiences uh, of folk who are near death uh, and messages from folk who have died. Um, but, but I don't think there's specifically a book yet uh, about dreams in that way. Yeah. Am I right in thinking that perhaps Julian of Norwich had a near-death experience? Could be. Because it looks be. like it from some of the details she describes. Yes, yes. And, and there's a wonderful painting um, by Hieronymus Bosch called The Ascent of the Blessed. Uh, some of you may have seen it. It's part of a triptych in a cathedral. And this part of the panel is completely black, uh, but with a circle of light and a soul being guided by an angel into this circle of light, which looks very much like a tunnel and the whole scene looks very much like how people describe classic near-death experiences. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you described, or people described, seeing relatives once they <coughs> once they passed over, as it were. I'm just wondering about the type of recognition. Is this a type of recognition which is beyond our own cognition? Or is it that we actually see grandma in her 70s, mum in her 50s, and whoever, brother or sister in their 40s? And I'm reminded of, uh, if you've seen the cover of some of the Jehovah's Witnesses magazines, about this new life that's coming up and everybody's going to be together. And you see a grandma, a grandfather, and you see all the generations going there. And I look at that photograph and I think, well, if this is what's happening, um, I know who I'd rather be. <laughs> I wouldn't like to be the grandfather. Um, as a grandfather myself and looking back, it, w it was much more fun to be a dad. <laughs> and so on. So I think these recognitions are beyond our own cognition. And I'm just wondering what form they take. Is there any research that's been done into that at all? Because physical recognition is one thing, mm -hmm. but it, at, at what point in that person's life? Yeah, it depends really. There, um, most people who meet their deceased relatives, they see their relatives who were deceased. Maybe they'd been in poor health before they died and they looked a lot different to what they're used to. They're looking quite radiant and maybe people who'd had... Um, an amputation, for example, they get their limbs back and they're, and they're looking at a younger age generally and much more radiant. So when they meet them, when they're deceased, they look, yeah, much better. I don't know of any specific study in particular. No. Um, I, I'm aware that St. Augustine said that in heaven, I think we're all age 30. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, encounters that I've come across I, I, in the hospital setting... Um, First was, was my own grandma uh, many years ago, um, uh, and granddad had died before her, and shortly before grandma died, she could see granddad at the foot of the bed, uh, and he was the same age as he was when he died. Uh, more interestingly, but, but more tragically, uh, was a, a case of baby loss, and a mum who had lost a, a very, very early baby th uh, through miscarriage had a very lucid and vivid dream about seeing her daughter uh, who came and spoke with her in her dream, but daughter was age 12. But, but, but mum knew that that was daughter. Yeah, yeah. Last one, I think. Okay. Last one. Thank you. I wonder if your experience is the same as mine about doing, uh, conducting funerals. Maybe this is more for Andrew. Um, 
I have taken, since I've been here in the fellowship, I've taken to saying at funerals and services of remembrance for bereaved people about something about this sort of research. And my fellow clergy are saying, you can't say that. Um, you just, you know, the resurrection of Christ, that's all we know. Um, but on the other side, um, and we don't know what's happened to them. We don't know, you know, what God has decided with them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But on the other side, we seem to be seeing much more um, of what we call popular religion, you know, in the local papers and things. You know, Fred has died, reunited with Gladys, and so on. And I often think they've got be they've gone further than us. What is your experience, or the experience of others, maybe? Uh, I used to get far more sense out of the nursing staff uh, about uh, issues of life after death than, than, the, than the rest of my chaplaincy team, <laughs> who, who steered clear from the whole subject, uh, which always seemed a shame, because that's when people needed to know that there was more. Um, it, it was actually Penny who helped me in my ministry with, with dying people and bereaved families, uh, because I, I know Penny, as part of her work in, in, in her hospital, used to talk openly uh, to patients uh, about her research. Uh, and I sort of bit the bullet and, and thought, well, the bishop doesn't need to know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't need to speak with my chaplaincy team a, about this. But, but I found that the things that, that gave the most comfort weren't abstract doctrines, um, but experiences. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if, Penny, you want to build on that. No, I think you've said it all, really. Yeah. Right, well, we'll have to bring things to a close there. I'm, I suspect there may be more questions, but do say them up because there is still the forum this afternoon. So, you know, bring your unanswered questions along to that. Um, study of near-death experiences seems to me to bring together all, really, all the elements that this fellowship is focused upon, you know? Um, and we should always remember, I think, that it's a fellowship for psychical and spiritual studies. You know, we mustn't forget that word, studies. And today we've had two, I think, superb examples of how that study, those studies, can be conducted into this crucially important area. Um, and Let's remember, this is being done, this work's being done now, today, in 2013. It's not 50 years past in the, you know, it's not 50 years back in the past. It's modern cutting day research, and it's going on now, 60 years after the fellowship was founded. So, let's thank Penny and Andrew for all they've given us this morning. Thank you.